everybody. I'm going to talk about uh, distributed columnar HEP analysis using Coffee and Dask. Um, so for everyone that wants to follow along, uh, along in the timetable, there is the uh, GitHub repository and the two uh, links to run on Binder Hub or MindBinder, which are also in the readme of the GitHub repository. So I checked half an hour ago, those links should work and they should take you to a Jupyter Lab session with the uh, this tutorial uh, notebook open. And I'm going to personally move over there and I'm going to run this uh, locally on my machine, but you can follow along using uh, either uh, Binder or Binder Hub. Okay, so uh, fair warning in this talk, I'm going to assume some familiarity with the upward and awkward way of handling with data. Basically, I'm just not, it's not going to be an awkward tutorial or what like every single operation is doing. Uh, I will assume that uh, people can have a, a very basic understanding of uh, uh, what is going on over there. And so uh, let's begin. Uh, so uh, first, I would like to briefly explain some uh, thing, some things. So what is columnar analysis? So in the good old fashioned way, we would run event loop analysis, which means that uh, you read some uh, relevant values for a specific event into local variables. You evaluate several expressions, you store the derived values, and you repeat and loop over all of the events, and that all the events, and that's an explicit uh, outer loop. So for columnar analysis, what happens is you load the relevant values in, of many events all at once into contiguous arrays, and you evaluate stuff using uh, programming array programming expressions. And now there is an implicit you know loop there, but it's usually running in the back end, uh, and you don't see it in compiled code. And then you store the derived uh, values in the end. So this is like a sketch of what is happening. So the, in the left you would see like the old event loop analysis. You would loop over the events and in a columnar way, you uh, quote unquote do things at the same time for multiple events, but there is this uh, implicit uh, inner loop that you don't see. And here is also like a code on the right, like a concrete example of how you would write an event loop analysis in C++ and how you would do the same thing using columnar analysis in coffee or maybe just plain uh, upward and awkward. Okay. So what is Dask? So Dask, uh, what Dask does is it provides an interface for specifying and locating input data, and then it describes manipulations uh, on those data that are organized into a task graph. Now this task graph can then be executed or on your local machine or in a cluster. So, and it also provides a Dask array and Dask data frame, which are these, uh, uh, they, they work like NumPy arrays or pandas data frames and help you, help you uh, describe and create all those task graphs, create and describe all those manipulations. And um, so what they do is they this uh, these things like Dask array and Dask data frame, they provide an interface to describe manipulations of data that may not fit into system memory all at once by mapping transformations onto chunks or partitions of those data that do fit into system, uh, system memory. And now here's a sketch of what is going on. You in Dask, you start by some, from some collections like Dask array, Dask data frame, and so on. And you describe manipulations there. And what it creates is it creates a task graph of operations operations to be computed. And this task graph is directed as cyclic graph, and you can then execute it using some schedulers and clients and clusters that can be like maybe in the single machine, uh, like threads or your, or your machine, or even on an entire cluster. And on the right, this is a sketch of what a Dask array is. So a Dask array is that is a larger array uh, of uh, uh, smaller chunks uh, that, that are NumPy arrays and that the, these things will fit into system memory. So but okay, but all those describe uh, rectangular data well, but in physics, we're dealing with jagged or ragged arrays. And a ragged or jagged array is something like this. And the reason we're dealing with those uh, things in physics is that you don't know how many particles you're, you're going to detect in an event. So maybe in the first event, uh, which would be the rows in a jagged array, you detected three leptons and they have a transfer momentum of one, two, and three respectively. In the second event, you detected only one. In the third event, you detected none and, and so on. So so uh, a solution here would be to pad to the maximum length, but that's very inefficient. So we need a way uh, to deal with these types of jagged arrays. So in the Pythonic HEP ecosystem, we deal with those kinds of arrays using awkward. And awkward arrays are general tree-like data structures like JSON, but are contiguous, contiguous in memory and are operated upon with uh, compiled and vectorized code like, num, uh, like NumPy. So you write NumPy-like manipulations uh, and to those uh, arrays. And for more information, you can visit the awkward array docs or see previous talks from Jim Um Okay. 
So uh, how we merge all that into coffee and uh, and ask how we merge all those together. So what has happened is that Awkward 2 provides an improved and streamlined backend. Uh, and the backend is only C and Python, no C++ metadata handling. And all those delayed lazy computations in Awkward 1 that used to be with ak.virtual are now replaced by a new uh, package, Dask Awkward, which, is, uh, which uh, provides all this um, wrapping around Awkward. And now, and also Dask Histogram, and they both bring delayed distributed computation to Awkward Array 2.0. Uh, analysis, uh, based analysis and libraries. And now Uproot also provides lazy data reading of data via uh, uh, function. Instead of uh, Uproot open, you would use Uproot Dask to lazily read the data. So uh, what would be our chunks that I described above, like the, uh, the, the partitions? Okay, so those are split, uh, we split on the event axis since each event is independent and we never run computations that combine more than one event. So a chunk of events is gonna be uh, a partition for us in high energy, uh, in high energy physics. Okay, so all that now provides access to Dask at all layers of analysis, and uh, we have improved parallelism and better factoriz factorization away from compute infrastructures. And now uh, coffee and particularly nano events has been, um, uh, which was almost entirely uh, based on ak.virtual, now leverages all this uh, infrastructure. For more details on the infrastructure, you can uh, view uh, Lindsay's CHEP 2023 talk and some more recent talk during the, um, uh, that took part recently from Lindsay and uh, Jim. So let's start showcasing all that. So uh, in the beginning, we would have to import some stuff. So we import uh, Dask, we import Awkward, we import Dask Awkward, we import Uproot, we import a hist and hist.dask, which is the Dask interface of hist. And then we also import some uh, coffee things like the processor, uh, nano events factory, base schema. And those will make more sense, but basically uh, processor is just to use an abstract base class from there. Nano events factory is to construct our events. Uh, and read our events. Uh, a base schema is uh, schemas in coffee are uh, things that tell you how to read and how to construct your event. Uh, how to construct your events. Uh, you shouldn't be really interested in this because we only use this for uh, one particular purpose only, and I will explain that later. And we also uh, uh, import some things from coffee, like apply to file set and pre-process. These are to uh, apply our analysis to our uh, to a set of data sets. Or and pre-process to pre-process our uh, data set and split those, split them into equal partitions beforehand. We also want to import client from Dask Distributed and Matplotlib for plotting, but uh, all those will make more sense uh, along the way. So uh, we start by reading some uh, data with Nano Events Factory, and uh, in order to understand more about how Nano Events constructs the events array, you can read the Coffee Docs or see a, a PyHep 2020 uh, talk from uh, Nick Smith. But basically, uh, Nano Events Factory is based. Oh, I didn't import. Uh, yeah, but basically, uh, Nano Events Factory is gonna uh, read uh, the events, and it's gonna the schema, which by default here is Nano EOD schema because I'm you I'm reading a Nano EOD uh, file. Uh, tells it tells it how to read those events and organize them. For for example, it will take like all the variables that are electron underscore something uh, from the in the file and organize them into an electron collection or an electron candidate that it knows that it should behave as a vector so you can perform four vector manipulations and stuff like that on them. So if we print the, uh, so this is now a lazy array. We didn't read anything yet. We just started uh, lazily reading uh, uh, the array. So, but it read some metadata. And if we print those fields, we can see that this events array now has some fields like uh, jet, neon, HLT, met, electron somewhere here, photon, proton, and so on. And uh, a lot of those uh, fields will also have subfields. For instance, the electron will have its uh, own variables as subfields, like maybe uh, PT, phi, uh, eta is somewhere here, and so on. So now, now also these electron objects and the photon objects respectively know that they should behave as a vector and you can do things. Now, uh, now this is a still a lazy Dask awkward collection. And in order to actually compute something, you would have to call compute.compute .compute on a collection. For example, you can do events.electron.pt.compute 
And now you actually read the data and load it into memory. So now this is what the PT uh, should look like. If I didn't call compute and I just did this, I would just get dask awkward PT uh, and partitions one. So it's we didn't read anything yet, but by computing, we actually go in the file and read this uh, particular column that is the Electron PT, and we load it now into memory, and we can view exactly um, it's a thousand events, has a variable length, and so on. So let's start by demonstrating and showcasing how that works uh, by running a tag and probe analysis. So I want to briefly explain what a tag and probe analysis is. Uh, is suppose you want to measure some identification efficiency in your data, um, and you because you cannot trust your uh, simulation to perfectly describe the detector response, you need to do this in data and categorize signal in the background by inference. So the question is, how do you do this without selection bias? Uh, the answer is thanks to the Z boson or maybe another resonance like the J psi. Uh, basically pick your favorite resonance that works. Uh, you can tag one electron in an event that passes some high quality requirement, and you can then look for a probe electron such that the invariant mass of the pair matches that of the Z boson. And if you count the number of probes uh, falling in some mass window that pass and fail uh, our criteria, in our case, our identification criteria, we can infer the true electron tagging, of, tagging efficiency in data, uh, despite not knowing the ground truth for each electron because we're on, operating on data and not the simulation. So there is no uh, ground truth that we can uh, know. Uh, and I'm going to take it one step further in this example, and I'm going to use photons instead of uh, electrons. Suppose you want to know some identification, uh, some identification efficiency for photons, but uh, the photons will interact uh, roughly the same way as electrons in your uh, calorimeter. So you can use, so they will have a Z peak, and you can you can technically measure them using electrons that have been uh, reconstructed as photons in your eCal. So um, first, I'm going to define a function. Um, and I'm going to briefly explain what this does. It will be used later. So basically, this function takes some leptons, and it takes some uh, online objects. Uh, we call those trigger objects in CMS in particular, uh, some PDGID, some PT, and some filter bit that corresponds to uh, um, the trigger that we want our leptons to have fired. And it matches uh, leptons with online trigger objects using a delta R uh, less than 0.1 criterion. So it, it, for every lepton, it will search for uh, if there is a, a trigger, a, if it's an online object, a trigger object with a certain PDG ID, with a PT greater than something, and with um, a filter bit corresponding to this trigger that we want to check set to on, and it will return a, a Boolean array, the same, uh, that has the same dimensionality as leptons with trues or false, depending on whether they fired this particular trigger uh, to the filter bit. And you can read if you want through this code, but what this does basically is just um, takes the trigger objects, uh, set some PT requirements, set some ID requirement, requ requires them to have passed a certain filter bit. And this is a CMS specific way that we encode the trigger information. So uh, I don't want to go into a lot of detail about that. Mask the, po the possible trigger candidates that have passed all those three requirements. Creates a uh, delta R table between the leptons and the uh, trigger candidates using this coffee specific metric table function. And if they search for those that have uh, delta R less than 0.1, and it searches if there's at least one match uh, of each for each lepton with a trigger object with delta R less than 0.1, uh, then it sets this that says that, okay, this lepton actually fired the trigger you were asking for. Okay, so we will use this function in the future. Uh, so uh, going back to our tag and probe study, we want to select uh, diphotons in our case. So how do we select diphotons? Uh, the function that will help us to do this is uh, ak.cartesian on axis equals one, which is the default. And this operation is equivalent to this following C++ for loop. So uh, it basically loops over two collections and it creates the Cartesian product of, uh, uh, creates all the pairs. And uh, this is a cartoon of the operation. And uh, because we want to create pairs of photons, like uh, both like our numbers and letters here will also be photons. So some photons will be matched with themselves and we don't want those. We will need to drop those pairs that have been matched with themselves. Another uh, operation we could have used, but will not is uh, ak.combinations. 
uh, which is equivalent to this C++ uh, for loop. So what this does is it finds all pairs within a single uh, with a single collection without repetition. But this um, uh, doesn't. Uh, count uh, pairs both ways. So for instance, if you have uh, two leptons uh, two leptons in an event, two electrons, it will count the first electron as a tag and the second one as a probe, but not the other way around. It will not count the second one as a probe, uh, as a tag and the first one as a probe. So we will need to do it twice and concatenate those, uh, which is why I find it simpler and to avoid this concatenation to use the Cartesian and just drop the uh, diagonal. So th these operations basically, um, a Cartesian constructs the full uh, two by two matrix of all the pairs, and AK dot combinations uh, constructs the upper tri uh, triangle of a two by two matrix. If you, if you, or a two dimensional matrix. Sorry, if you think about it this way. So uh, let's start performing our tag and probe. So I will uh, go into through this code explicitly. Uh, so first of all, we select our events uh, from the starting events that we have read. We select events that have uh, fired this specific trigger, uh, that have fired an isolated electron with a transfer of momentum greater than 30 GeV. And then we move on by finding all possible diphoton pairs and removing pairs of photons with themselves. So we create the arg Cartesian in the beginning instead of just the Cartesian, and uh, not diagonal is uh, mean, not diagonal is basically this operation in awkward and uh then we mask we mask out and we only uh, we only take the non diagonal elements and we create use this awk.zip operation and create an array with fields tag and probe uh, these will have the same dimensionality and the first field the tag will refer to the tag photon and the second field the probe will refer to the probe photon uh then we want our uh, those Z candidates that we have constructed, which is basically an array of all the possible pairs. We want the tags to have passed uh, a tight uh, cut-based identification, which in our case is this uh, greater than three for photons. And we mask out the Z candidates that have passed it. So we drop all the other pairs that have that where the tag hasn't passed this requirement. And uh, then we, uh, and also an extra requirement is that for the tags, to not be in the transition region between our barrel and end cap in CMS. So we don't want them to fall between uh, eta 1.44 and 1.566. And we mask Z candidates again. So we run this. And then uh, let's go a little bit uh, more into um, what is happening over here. So um, we have our masked Z candidates. We just rename uh, good events trigger object to trig objects. We set some uh, uh, PT and eta cuts on the tags and the probes that we want them to pass. And then we request the tag to be an electron and not a photon content code in the sense that there is an associated electron with our hits in the calorimeter. Uh, this just basically just says this because uh, uh, an uh, electron index, an associated electron index um, not equal to minus one means that there is an associated electron. And it also means that the tag uh, has a pixel seed. So it means that it, it, it there were hits in the tracker. So it is in, indeed a um, an electron that was also reconstructed as a photon in our calorimeter. And then what we basically say is we also use this uh, trigger match function and we want the tags, in particular, the uh, associated electron of the tags. And this is a nice coffee helper function as well uh, to have fired this electron 30 trigger. And then we mask out Z, can Z, Z candidates uh, or candidate pairs with all the previous requirements. Uh, then we then we drop every event that doesn't have a good tag in the sense where um, good means that all the previous requirements have been uh, passed and the tag fired this trigger. And uh, then we mask out everything according to those uh, and then we mask out according to those like Z country objects and good events. And then what we basically say is we only allow uh, invariant mass of tag probe pairs between 50 and 130 GV. So we calculate the mass of the pair. And this is basically, this comes from nano events. The fact that tags and probes can now be added as a four vector. This is a coffee thing. And you can call dot mass on them. And it knows that you've added two four vectors and you can calculate their invariant mask. We, ma we mask this invariant mass. We mask Z candidates again, uh, drop all the pairs that are outside of this mass window. And 
Um, then now we want to check the efficiency of tight cut based ID, and that is three in an IOD for photons. So uh, therefore, a passing probe is a probe that has passed this ID requirement, and a failing probe is one that didn't. Uh, and this is what we do here. And passing pairs are Zcans where uh, where this passing is passing probe is true, and failing pairs is the Z pairs where this is false. This is a not statement in Python. And then we uh, calculate the invariant mass of those uh, pairs and we flatten them and we flatten it as well because we want to uh, fill uh, histograms. And uh, now, uh, now up until this point, nothing has been computed. So all those computations you see, like all those cells run instantly. So what Dask has now created in the back end, and this is what I basically wanted to explain at this point, is uh, um, that... Uh, uh, nothing has been computed, and that all these operations have only been run on a type tracer array. A type tracer array is basically an array that tracks the type through all these operations, and the task graph has been a task graph has been created, which you can inspect. So you can use this task function, dask.visualize, and uh, on some uh, collection, which is now this passing pairs mass, and you can view this graph. And it will take maybe, and I can double click so you can zoom on it. So this has been created by all of what we've been doing so far. So this graph starts from reading our events and all of the operations have been created in a graph here. Like this is the beginning operation where we dropped the events that uh, where this HLT L30 uh, wasn't fired and so on. And you can scroll through that. And in the end, um, uh, this is uh, here is the where we apply the electron index, the pixel seed, and so on. And you can scroll through this graph, and all these operations have uh, have been created in the graph. And in the end, what you do end up is a final an endpoint. So you start in the beginning, and this is our flattening operation in the end, and you end up uh, somewhere. Uh, so this is what happened. And like if you see zoomed out, it's like some long, and. Uh, this still hasn't been evaluated. So I would like to note at this point that uh, what we can do is that you can uh, now, you can lazily write with uproot uh, arrays or events to root files using uproot.daskwrite. And you can also use, remember that we talked in the beginning that you have uh, partitions and a partition is a chunk of events. Now, because I didn't specify partition, now like all of my events are just one partitions, but because now I'm running only on a thousand events, so this all fits well into memory. But you can use this dask write function and you can uh, write this passing pairs collection. And I want to write three partitions. So this will write one file per partition, basically. That's why I'm using this repartition. And it will put them in an, a directory called output. And it will add the prefix passing pairs to the files and in a, a T tree called my tree. And compute equals true means to actually do this operation on the spot. If you have used uh, uh, compute equals false, this wouldn't. This would also be lazy, and you wouldn't start writing on the spot. So I, I can have. I have three files here in my output directory on the left. And if I uh, read them again, and I can lazily read them with upload dask and. Uh, now, what this that actually has is it wrote basically uh, this uh, passing pairs array, which has some tag and some probe uh, fields, and it uh, now I wrote them and reread them to a file, and this is still now with upper dask, this is a lazy connection, so I can uh, call compute and maybe evaluate, you know, this uh, array and I get some uh, PT back. Okay. Uh, do we have to stop at this point and evaluate this task graph above? No. We can go one step further, and because in the end, in HEP, we fill histograms. So uh, we use Dask histogram for that, and it's minimal interface with hist. And here we define, remember, we imported Dask, uh, hist.dask before. We define two histograms with some axes, uh, some invariant mass, and we fill those with invariant mass of the passing pairs and the failing pairs. And what has actually happened here is if I print this out, has staged fills. Uh, these histograms are now still are part of the uh, above task graph. So the above task graph has been extended and this histogram is actually empty. So I called fill, but nothing has been filled yet. And this stage fills returns true means that there are fills to be done. So now I can visualize those and uh, yeah, I can visualize those histograms. And you can see that, yeah, they're still part of the above large task graph again. So the above large task graph has been extended in the end. And if I go to the end to the right, uh, now uh, 
I was uh, I was here before at the flatten above. So what has been added is this histone block and hist reduce. So now this is uh, this is the histogramming part that has been added to the task graph. And uh, actually, what Dask will do before computing is it will optimize the graph to reduce node multi multiplicity because each one of these nodes can be run on a separate uh, cluster on a separate on a separate location. So if I pass in optimize equals true, this is the end optimized graph that Dask will produce. And another operations that uh, we can another thing that we can check is uh, basically. Uh, to minimize event reading, what Dask Awkward does is it uh, keeps track of the necessary columns. And necessary columns is the necessary branches that it needs from the file to read when it uh, when it's actually performing the computation to perform this computation. So I can pass in dactyl necessary columns here, and I can pass two collections like h pass and h fail, which are the histograms that are defined above, and we get some. Um, list of uh, branches, and it actually, we know that to perform this computation, we only need these fields, so we don't need to read the whole event, and this is what it will actually do while performing the computation. It will only need um, re read those fields, fields, those branches, to minimize uh, data reading. Uh, and for more information on this optimization, you can visit the Dask Awkward docs about the necessary columns optimization. So uh, now we can actually plot those, uh, we can actually compute those histograms and we can uh, uh, view them. So we take the H pass and H fill from above, we call compute on top of them, and then we plot, uh, and then we plot them. So now we should get, it took like a second to run maybe, and now we get two invariant mass histograms. Um, not a great Z peak because we only started from a thousand events, but if you started from like, say, a lot of events, you would get a much better Z peak here. And you can see this is the invariant mass of the passing probes with uh, the tags, and this is the invariant mass of the failing probes with their respective tags. And uh, normally here, what one would do is it, uh, they would fit this with a signal plus background model to infer uh, exactly the uh, number of uh, probes that are uh, that are coming actually from a ZPIC and to uh, uh, remove any background that is, that is here. And our efficiency, our identification efficiency would be uh, this uh, number of passing uh, divided by the number of passing and the uh, number of failing plus number of failing. And this would be our uh, um, identification efficiency for cut base type that we want to test uh, above. Um, yeah, so up until this point, uh, we've been doing a lot of things manually. We manually read our events. We use nano events factory. We did from root. We call dot compute explicitly on each collections. And, uh, and we've been very explicit just to demonstrate like how this task graph, like how all these operations build, uh, that you do uh, become part of a large task graph. But uh, this isn't the most efficient way of dealing with things. So first of all, you would normally want to use dask.compute on uh, things so that Dask optimizes and fuses all those separate task graphs because things are gonna be task graphs together as much as it can. And secondly, we've been computing things uh, locally using threads in our previous example. And normally one would use like their favorite cluster, a distributed cluster or a client um, or anything like that on their institute or CERN on maybe wherever they are. So let's see now how we would actually run a coffee analysis. So let's run a mock analysis. Uh, ignore this commented out part. It's basically if you want to run this on larger files, but in binder, you shouldn't be able to run this. I don't think I've put the necessary requirements to read files over XRUD. And also if we all start reading files from uh, EOS public from CERN, that's technically a DDoS attack. So we don't want to do that. So I've put some smaller and uh, files within the data directory. So uh, let's see how we would not, uh, run an analysis using uh, coffee uh, in 2024. So we would first define a file set, and this is a dict of dicts and so on. So uh, we would define our data our data sets. So this is a ZZ to four new data sets and a data set, and this is a standard model Higgs to ZZ to four Latin data set. And for each one of those data sets, you would define the files, which is a dictionary of file paths and trees. Uh, and notice that here I've added some fake files that do not exist. And uh, this is to mimic basically what would happen if maybe a file does not exist or you think it exists, 
or maybe you try to access a remote file uh, that then basically the server doesn't respond and you fail to read the file at that point. So uh, normally uh, one would use uh, here, what one would use here is it would use, they would use this pre-process function of coffee that we imported earlier and they would run this on their file set. And someone would specify maybe skip bad files equals true. Uh, if, uh, if this was false, which is the default, it would error because I add some files here that do not exist and would specify a uh, step size. And let's see what this does. So we started with a file set and it returns two things, data set updated and data set runnable. Uh, okay, so let's run this. And if I look at data set runnable, so it's basically like our file set above, only some extra information has been added here. So what has happened here is that the files that did not exist were actually dropped from the from the from our file set, and the steps thing has been specified. So now it went in, it basically read metadata, number of events, and so on. It spent and maybe we asked for uh, step size, and it split our uh, each one of our files to partitions of roughly 100,000 events. Because the number was exactly divisible by 100,000, it's exactly uh, 100,000 events, but normally it would be roughly 100,000 events. Uh, so uh, like you can see on the second file, the second file had that many number of, uh, number of events, so it did a, a little bit of a different splitting, uh, but close to 100,000 events. Um, okay, so uh now uh now when we read this if we if someone were to were, were to read this dictionary of uh only the files and it would just do maybe upload the task of just this dictionary here uh they would get uh upload task would only would read all of the events would read uh how many partitions do we have here one two three four would read the data into five partitions each partition of 100,000 events. Uh, while before, when we were running our mock tag and probe, we didn't specify anything. We didn't specify any partition. So all a, all, all a thousand events that we had have been just one partition. So, but you're running, usually in your analysis, you're running over billions of events, maybe, or millions, I don't know. And so you want to specify uh, chunks of events that are small enough to fit into system memory of your cluster or whatever machine you're uh, running. Uh, okay, so generally you would want to use this function when running coffee analysis in the beginning. So a coffee concept that is actually not required anymore is something that's called the coffee processor, and I have a link to the docs here, but it's still a useful organization tool. Uh, basically what we want is our analysis to be described in a function that is function of events that defines the analysis. So it basically t uh, tells, this function should tell uh, what you want to do with your events and what to return in the end. Uh, and then uh, Coffee would take this function using the apply to file set function that uh, we uh, imported previously and apply this function to every data set of your uh, file set. So um, if a processor is used, then the processors dot preprocess events method will be the one applied to file set. So now I want to uh, write up a fancy formion analysis that is going to be searching for diboson events. So uh, it's going to be a, a little bit of a complicated example, so I'll try to go through it slowly. But it basically showcases all of the tricky things that uh, beginners will uh, get stuck on. Uh, and that is like using awkward array building, uh, JIT compilations, using Dask awkward map partition functions to apply functions uh, to their events that cannot or are not written in plain awkward to partitions. Uh, and also maybe defining their custom uh, vector collections. And um, one such example in the coffee code would be this, like of map partitions that I wanted to uh, that I wanted to show uh, later uh, in a bit. Is that um, uh, yeah? So this is basically this is basically now how you would run write an analysis in uh, coffee twenty twenty four. Um, you didn't have to do like these things in the coffee.7, like the map partition and stuff like that. And it was, uh, so I will try to explain all the tricky things. Now also notice that in the following example, I will be using awkward.sum function instead of dask awkward.sum function uh, because uh, there is an automatic dispatch 
from awkward to dash awkward. So when you call awkward some function to some collection that is a dash awkward collection, it will be like uh, calling dash awkward this uh, uh, dot some function on the same collection. There is an automatic dispatch between awkward and dash awkward, and uh, I will also use the uh, base schema instead of the nano EOD schema, which is the default, to sh showcase how one would uh, build custom vector collections. And this wouldn't be required if I had used the nano EOD schema, because if I had used the nano EOD schema, uh, Coffee would automatically know to put that electrons is a vector and that it should have vector methods and vector behavior and all that sort of that. So I will use the base schema to uh, so that we actually construct these vectors itself. So maybe to showcase maybe some tricky uh, cases that someone um, uh, will have to use in their analysis. And uh, you can also try read the processor yourself and understand what it's doing. So uh, in the beginning, I'm going to import uh, number, right? And the first thing that I want to show is that uh, we generally want to write operations in a columnar way and describing vector arrays uh, and describing, sorry, uh, array uh, using array operations, but sometimes that is hard to do, uh, either because it's not possible or because it's unintuitive. And we would like our old for loop way, which is, which in my opinion is uh, a bit easier to understand or to read and not do any mental gymnastics with uh, array operations. So I want to def use here and showcase an example, which is a very tricky, it can be a tricky example, which is to use awkward arrays array builder. So I will write a kernel function uh, using awkward array builder and that will search for each event for valid four lepton combinations. And a valid combination, a valid uh, event has two pairs of leptons that each have, uh, uh, that each pair has opposite charge. So because we want to search for diboson events. And um, and this outputs an array of events dot candidates with indices equal to three. And these indices correspond to all valid permutations of all valid combination, combinations of unique leptons in each event, uh, omitting permutations of the pairs. Uh, so I can uh, use awkward arrays array builder, and I, I refer you to the awkward array docs to read the capabilities of array builder. And this is basically now we're taking events leptons and builder, and we're writing a dumb for loop that would be very very slow if it like something like that was pure Python. But awkward, you can uh, JIT compile this. You can JIT compile uh, JIT, awkward array builder is JIT compilable. So. We go over a dumb for loop for leptons and events leptons. We begin uh, to, I will refer you to the documentation to read like exactly what are the capabilities of the builder. We begin a list. We uh, count the number of leptons. Uh, we loop over. Um, uh, and then we search for uh, valid for lepton combinations. And if you can find two pairs of, this is basically what this loop is doing, is if you can find two pairs of opposite charges each, uh, you add those indices to the builder and you end uh, this tuple and you end the list and you return the builder. And this is JIT compilable. And then now we would want to apply this to our uh, to our uh, events. So now what I would do is I cannot call this uh, function directly to our events uh, because it will complain because we're running we're uh, writing running on Dask awkward and not on a good old fashioned eager awkward 1.0. Uh, so now write a uh, find for left on function. And now uh, what happens during the, as I said previously, what happens during the task graph creation is it first runs uh, on type tracer arrays. So it's basically like a mock array, type tracer array that tracks the type through all the operations and uh, builds the graph and, and builds this task graph that can then be evaluated. So basically these functions, when we're running over a function that is not written in plain awkward or dash awkward, we have to use like a, a switch. So if the backend of the input is type tracer, so uh, we will return uh, this output and this basically just mocks the output because we want the output, the output is going to be an array of four indices. So we mock, we create a uh, mock array and we take and we convert this array into a type tracer array and return that. So uh, this is what we would do when running the type tracer. 
Otherwise, if we're not running on the type tracer array, we we just have the regular uh, lepton kernel function. We pass uh, in the leptons an awkward arrays array builder inside. Um, so, and what you also need to do is when you're faking this, when you're faking this output is you need to use functions like uh, touch data so that this keeps track and uh, so that it keeps track of the necessary columns and the necessary, the necessary branches of the output. Just because in our kernel, what we only need is charge. We only need this branch, this field from the leptons. We will touch the data uh, we will touch data uh, and we'll touch the event leptons dot charge. Now, uh, sometimes you may also want the uh, uh, not just touch, but you may also want uh, the return uh, a, a, an actual type tracer that you can uh, perform manipulations on. And here you would use length zero if type tracer or length one if type tracer, depending on your specific operation. And I want to go into the coffee code with this and show an example of what has happened here. Like this is an example of uh, uh, using that is that we want to apply this uh, jitted function. And uh, this is a, we want to apply this jitted function. And here uh, we want to apply it to runs and loomies. So someone would maybe do runs this uh, awkward to numpy of this awkward type tracer length zero of type tracer of runs, and the same for uh, loomies. And um, because now they want these runs and the loomies, they want the output. And then um, you can actually uh, use apply your compiled kernel to these runs and loomies. And if the backend is type tracer, you take this mask you take this mask out and you return a type tracer array. Otherwise, you return the normal mask out uh, over here. This is like an example of how you would write uh, functions that are not um, uh, that are uh, cannot be written in plain awkward. Uh, you would have to use uh, either uh, you would have to create a function of with just that is just numpy or something that you can JIT compile, and then you will need the wrapper function with uh, that tells you what how to run over it when running uh, when computing and when running on the type tracer and uh, just uh, just uh, run it. And then now this function you can call map partitions on, so you can apply this function. On every partition of the on every partition of your input data. So now let's go into the uh, dynamic processor and let's go and let's see what uh, how we run our analysis. So here we define a class. Uh, so we want the coffee processor and it's a nice organization tool. We pass in we inherit from the abstract base class and here we could have an init method. Maybe you can store some variables and you, maybe you want some things in an init method, but here it's not required in this case. And we want to define a process function that is just a function of events. Um, okay, and you create some histograms here in the beginning. Um, basically, all that is creating some histograms that you want to fill. I will not go into a lot of depth into what is happening in every single line of those because that's not the point. It's basically to uh, tell you how to uh, run a coffee analysis or how you would run a coffee analysis. Uh, but normally, you would write your processor that does things. So here in my processor, um uh defining some histograms in the beginning that i want to fill and i'm also defining a, a a dictionary here i'm getting the data set which is uh events .metadata .data set from the files that i applied above and now here is one also another tricky part is because i'm going to be using base schema so uh now uh when running this uh, processor uh, coffee is not going to read the events with a nano EOD schema. So it will not know that muons and the fields like muon underscore something should all be put together in a four vector. Uh, so now I would define a custom vector. And here you can use coffee's vector or scikit hep vector for this uh, with tiny differences. But I'm here I'm going to zip those fields together, eta, phi, mass, charge, and some other variable isolation. And I'm going to tell it to behave like pt, eta, phi, m candidate. This is a coffee. Uh, this is a coffee class, and uh, also uh, define its behavior as candidate dot behavior. This is the only reason I imported candidate pre uh, import imported candidate previously, so that now it perfectly knows how you how that muons should behave like a four vector, like a coffee four vector. And for this, you could have used scikit-hep vector as well. Um, 
if I had, uh, if I'm gonna run this with uh, Nano IoT Skimmer, this wouldn't be necessary because this this would automatically be done, and uh, muons would behave uh, like that uh, by themselves. Uh, so now I want to uh, I sort all the muons by transverse momentum, and okay, and cut flow is basically a dictionary to keep track of how many events are passing each uh, cut. So in the beginning, uh, all events is basically this. Uh, I'm counting the number of uh, muons on axis zero. So I'm basically just counting all the number of muons. Um, then I'm passing some quality and minimum cuts, maybe on the muons. I'm filling a histogram. Um, and uh, I'm, yeah, um, skip events without enough muons because I want, I in order to search for the Ibozen events, I need at least four muons if I invent to search for, com for valid combinations. And now here comes the part where I use my previous function. So uh, I told you, you cannot apply this function directly, uh, find four leptons off uh, muons, but you can use, you can apply this function find for leptons, uh, you can map partition that function. So I would call dac.map partitions uh, on, uh, I want to apply find the find for lepton function on our muons, which is basically this variable. And then uh, because this function is returning indices, I'm basically like uh, getting all those pairs by just doing this uh, loop over the uh, indices because the uh, find for lepton is going to return indices and not uh, muons, like uh, where those valid muons are. And then I'm basically uh, getting my uh, combinations, define uh, zipping them. And this is maybe our first uh, Z. Uh, this is the second Z. Um, uh, this is constructed by the first and the second muon in this uh, four muon array. And this is constructed by the second, the, th no, the first and the second and the third and the fourth here. And um, P4 is basically the addition of the four vector of the two. And I want uh, at least one candidate. I want to have at least one pair. Um, and I require, and then maybe I require a minimum uh, dimuon mass. I'm just doing uh, of the first of the first diboson to have a, a mass greater than 60 and the second diboson to have a mass greater than 20. Um, then I'm also keeping track. I'm adding them to the cut flow to see how many muons are actually uh, passing after each one of those cuts and I'm, I'm putting. I'm choosing as the best as uh, bo uh, boson as the uh, as the one that is uh, closer to the z mass, closer to the nominal z boson mass, and then I'm flattening the final array and I'm just filling the histograms that I added previously. So I'm just filling um, uh, the mass. I'm filling the for the mass of the. Uh, invariant mass of the Z1, the invariant mass of the second boson. I'm feeling the PT of the, 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 the leading lepton of the Z1 and the second lepton of the, uh, the Z1. And I'm returning a dictionary, which has some keys and the histograms that I actually filled and uh, this cut flow uh, dictionary uh, here. And uh, this is basically not required anymore. The accumulator concept and the post-processing is not required anymore, but I have to add it here otherwise, uh, because I inherited from the processor base class, otherwise it will complain. So this is all basically like how you would write an analysis here. You want the process function of events that does things to your events and return stuff. And I highlighted some of the tricky parts. So let's actually run this cell. And now, uh, here comes the part where now we use coffee's apply to file set function. So now we take this we take this apply to file set function, and we want to apply our fancy dimuon processor to the uh, to our runnable uh, data set that we constructed previously. And we want to use base schema as our uh, as our schema on how to read those events. So let's do this. It run instantly. And it ran instantly because, as I said previously, I didn't do anything. I just constructed task graphs. So if we look at this to, to compute thing, is basically a dictionary exactly like my data set runnable, where for each data set, what has happened is that the for each data set that is the keys, the value is the return is what the processor returns. So for Z to form new, I have returned this entire dictionary of histograms and everything. And as you can see, all those have staged fields because I, fields as I, because I said uh, I haven't computed anything yet. And the same for the uh, standard model Higgs to four leptons data set. So uh, we took the, uh, we took the uh, file set, 
uh, we applied the processor to the file set. And for each data set of the file set, we have re we have put the output of the processor what, or what the processor returns in the same spot. So now uh, we can do some inspections. So we can check the necessary columns of to compute. And uh, this is basically like, and this technically is a good check to the to make sure that it makes sense uh, because you've only used muons and you've only used uh, only uh, six branches of the muons. So you should only have read that. If you're reading more data, it means that something is wrong uh, over there. More data that you actually needed in your computations. So here we only need the muon charge, eta, mass, this isolation, phi and PT. And same for, and the same for both of our data sets. Uh, okay, and now we can visualize these graphs, but now I'm not gonna render it on the notebook. I'm gonna save it uh, on the, I'm gonna save it to some files so I can take a look. And I'm gonna save two graphs here. And these uh, these will be saved and this should pop up here in, in, in a minute. Okay, yes. So I can open those, optimize the unoptimized graph. So this is basically the graph that we have constructed. So a starting point is each partition at the end. This is the graph that defines our analysis. And basically we end up in the end with some histograms that we end up. And now if we and now the optimized graph, what Dask was able to do by doing the optimization to reduce node multiplicity is it reduced it from that long graph to this. So now this is basically the graph we eh? actually don't we see ah excuse me. Oh, microphone is open. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, now to run this processor over the whole file set and uh, compute the result, you wouldn't want to run locally. So in Dask, we normally use a client, and this is going to spawn a client now on my machine that is going to use a local cluster. And in a real analysis, you would use uh, the cluster of your, uh, the, you would use a large cluster, maybe Condor, Slurm, or other cluster, depending on where you're running for from. So the way I would do this here locally is I would call this uh, client with no arguments, basically like the default, and that will spawn a client here. Uh, and uh, I can see some cluster info, uh, create a local cluster, create some workers and create like workers with the cores that I have on my machine. And uh, I don't want to go at the moment into a lot of detail over here. I will go into it briefly, but what you can do is you can monitor this cluster either by going to uh, the port. The default port is 8787 and you can also see it here. Uh, this shouldn't work on binder because this port is not forward is not forwarded to your computer. But I think on binder you can use the lab extension, which is also another thing, uh, Dask lab extension, and you can uh, specify I think proxy eight seven eight seven here, and you should be able to get your client. And you can either you know use a separate tab to monitor your cluster, or you can use this lag, lab extension extension. And there's a lot of interesting information here. You can open stuff, you can view things up, and uh, I can see that I have um, some workers uh, that have each 3.2 gigabytes of memory and two cores. This is running on my Mac. And I can see the progress. I can see the byte store per worker. And there is basically, you can explore the desk or you can read the docs. There's a lot of interesting things you can monitor during your computation um, uh, with uh, this, uh, with a client on the cluster. And it's gonna run quickly. I will try to switch to the other tab to show you that something is going on, but it's gonna be very quick because I'm running on some on a couple of files, only a couple of files. So now I'm, I'm just gonna take this to compute that I had before. And I'm basically just gonna ca uh, call dash.compute on it. And because this is gonna return a tuple, I'm just doing this to keep, to keep, to keep it like this here because that's the computer will always return a tuple and I'm also just going to time it. So let's run this and I want to switch to the other tab quickly. As you can see here, like it was very quick, but some tasks started happening. The process, some tasks were processed and so my, basically my local uh, CPU quickly computed this. And I got some coffee warnings here, but you, you shouldn't mind about those. This is basically some deprecation warnings about coffee. And what I did get what is actually the output is now exactly the same. So it took our to compute dictionary and it computed everything in those. So now there are no more stage fills. And now you can see that those histograms are actually filled and they have the storages have some value and some uh, variance and, uh, and they're actually filled. And now 
uh, what I can do is I can uh, pot them. So I'm ba I basically want to perform uh, by viewing my cut flow and the time that I used. I want to see how many events I processed. So I processed uh, roughly 329,000 events per second uh, on my machine right now. And uh, I'm not doing anything here. I'm not doing anything smart. So this is basically just to show you that we got a result and I'm just plotting the, my output. So I'm just getting this output and I'm just plotting things. So this is my cut flow. Maybe I got some distributions. This is basically like all the histograms that I added. Uh, blue is the first data set there and orange is the second data set, which is the standard model of the Higgs to four leptons. And you can see this makes sense because we actually have a peak uh, at 125 GV here. Um, and yeah, I'm plotting the mass Z2, plotting the, the PT of the first neon of the first diboson and so on. And I'm just plotting the histograms that I have. Okay. So this is basically what has happened, how, uh, what has happened. And I want to briefly go like over in one minute to go on how to convert an analysis from coffee.7 to coffee 2023, 2024, and so on. Uh, so it's not really hard to convert an analysis. So processors are not needed anymore. You could in principle use any function that is F of events that has the signature, but they are a nice organization tools. So coffee executors have been completely removed and Dask takes care of all that. Accumulators are not a thing anymore. Uh, awkward operations on Dask awkward uh, arrays are automatically dispatched as awk some function to DAC some function. Um, but I tend to try to import Dask awkward and actually use that instead of relying on the automatic dispatch, uh, just because it's a little bit more explicit and you do not run operations on eager arrays by accident, something that should be a task graph. Maybe it was eager for some reason because of a bug, maybe, because DAC some function will not work on eager arrays. So it's be better for, um, it will help you realize your mistakes even better. For histogramming, we import hist.dask as HDA. And hist.dask histograms behave like hist histograms and will return an actually filled histogram, hist, hist histogram when dot compute is uh, called. So uh, you will still need to import hist for convenient definition of axes. Uh, and uh, if you want to get a complete array or a histogram object and, uh, on uh, in memory on your local machine so that you can manipulate it, you can use array.compute or a histogram.compute or dask.compute uh, stuff. And stuff can be uh, either a list of things, a dictionary of things, basically any basic, any default Python collection of, of, dask, of dask collections, of task graphs uh, will be computed by dask. Um, this should be done at the end of the code uh, that is constructing arrays and do not call the uh, compute prematurely as it will drastically slow down your analysis code. Um, we use Dask clusters and clients to scale our analysis and run over uh, multiple events. And uh, most of the operations that are available in Awkward are available in Dask Awkward, apart from some of them that haven't yet been implemented or cannot be implemented uh, because they do not work uh, lazily. They don't make sense lazily, maybe. And if you encounter a piece of functionality in, in Dask Awkward that uh, you think should work, please open an issue on the Dask Awkward uh, GitHub page. And finally, functions that cannot be written in pure Awkward, and maybe you need uh, something that cannot operate directly on task graphs or maybe you want to write a JIT compiled function, maybe a kernel, maybe something like that, need to be wrapped in a Dask awkward uh, map partitions. Uh, okay, so if you follow the these steps, and uh, it shouldn't be hard to convert your analysis from uh, old coffee.7 to coffee2024. And uh, yeah, this was basically my uh, my tutorial. I uh, sorry if a few things were complicated like in the analysis, but like in the awkward operations, but that was not the point. The, uh, the point was basically how to write your analysis and what comes out of these operations, which is those task graphs and how to manipulate them and how to compute them. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot for this yeah, very extensive overview for all the great capabilities. I see a lot has happened in the last years. Um, so I'm sure there are some questions, some discussions were already going on during the talk on Slack on GPU acceleration. Are there any other questions to ask right now?
Maybe I can start with one. Um, so you showed um, <clears throat> this um, idea of um, storing intermediate steps. So it seems to be now an um, upload function to um, store directly result of a task computation on, on the disk. Um, are there some ways to um, get back also the behavior that was attached to this array? So I mean, in this case, for example, <clears throat> you had this um, uh, thing running as a nano events uh, behavior and now when you store it to to disk um i guess that will be lost so when, um, when i reread it then i can only really use um, this as a plain struct but not something that has uh, behavior attached yeah so this was an example here so i wrote i wrote something that i wouldn't normally write uh but if you write something that has the structure of uh, something coffee can read using their schemer. So if you take, let's say, uh, nano AOD or something and skim it and write actually nano AOD structure again uh, on the data, and then you just reread it with coffee, it will automatically, and you apply a schema to it, it will automatically be able to understand what is. So because basically the behavior is defined uh, from the file structure. So you can, and there's actually like two discussions on coffee right now on how there's a discussion on coffee on how to scheme nano events. So you should be able, maybe you read nano EOD, you scheme it, do some operations, write nano EOD to file, and then you should be able to finally uh, read it with coffee back and they will all behave fine. Here, what I'm writing is a dumb array. So it's like, it's a mock array. So it, like this has no structure. This has no uh, event structure. It just has some tags and a probe basically. Yeah. But I can I can define my behaviors. I can define my own vectors. But if you uh, if you write the proper structure, you should be able to, and that applies to a schema. You should be able to read it just fine. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, bit, maybe a little bit related question to this. I think when I yeah, if I would skim stuff like that, I would um, also in principle usually also want to read it again with um, yeah. Um, so I could have ecosystem, so I don't really care that it's in root format. Is there, would there also be possibilities to, to write this to parquet or arrow or something? Yes. Uh, yes, and that's provided directly for, uh, that, that's directly provided by Dask Awkward. So it's okay. basically the same like you would do ack dot to parquet, dac dot to parquet, and dac dot from parquet, and you can read uh, you can write files. Uh, I don't think uh, no, not all the awkward for formats are supported by Dask Awkward, but parquet is definitely supported. Like you know, to J, I don't think I don't remember. I don't think like for instance like to JSON uh, that is supported by Awkward is supported by Dask Awkward or something. Yeah. But uh, Parquet, definitely, yes. Very nice. So maybe it's some questions lazy. from somebody else. And, and, and it's lazy, like, exactly the same way. So you would have this compute argument, and you can choose to start writing now or later, and you would output one file per partition. So maybe then later you want to merge those uh, by something. Like, for root files, maybe you want to HAD or something like that. And there's also like a lazy reading function from from parquet files. Yes. Yeah. Da, 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 da dot from parquet. Some questions from somebody else before we go in break. One raised hand by Peter. Please go ahead. Hi, thanks for the, the nice presentation. Um, I'm sorry, you, you gave this example of uh, you know writing something in number to uh, handle cases which are a little tricky um, to, to write directly columnar. Um, is it still so, uh, sort of the design philosophy for awkward to not actually provide most awkward functionality in number functions? So you really do have to write it all out in full on for loops? No, you don't have to write it, but I mean something you you should be you should be trying to write everything in uh, awkward functions. Uh, but sometimes this is hard. Uh, like for instance, I mean, sorry, just, just I mean the, the the point is if you are dropping to number, at least as of a while ago, you basically didn't have any awkward functionality at all, except for maybe except for the array builder. Um, so you, you, one sort of has this like slightly un unfortunate situation where you, 
you, you know, it's either write everything columnar or write, you know, if you have to drop to number, you're writing everything in, in really full on for loops. Ah, um, and I was just, ah, you mean, that. Ah, you mean the number cannot compile arc dot something? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yes, I, 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 I'm pretty sure that's still the case, but I'm not the expert on that. I don't know if, uh, if Jim is here and wants to better answer that, but, uh, yeah, I think it's still the same in case. Sure. It, it, it's the same in this case. Um, but, uh, that was a design choice. Um, if, if we did provide oc dot this and oc dot that functions in number, that would be the less efficient way to use number. Um, number does provide numpy functions within number, and they're constantly fighting on stack overflow when, when somebody tries to use uh, a numpy function in number and they find that it's not any faster uh, because of the, you know, the order of operations is the same as it would be outside of number. Um, and then, you know, people say, what's, what gives, why is number not faster? And they have to explain this over and over. Um, yeah, we want to force, uh, uh, vectorized processing outside of number and non-vectorized processing inside of number, because if you're going to number, it's for, uh, well, it's at least partially for speed reasons, you know, not writing for loops in Python, um, uh, so yeah, that's that's why we make it this either or choice. Other than the fact that uh, implementing all the oct this and oct that functions in number would be essentially re-implementing the whole library. So short answer, yes, it's true, but um, but it's a design goal, so it's not like an accident. Okay. So yeah, before we go into the break, I can't resist um, one small follow-up question on this. So um, um, I, I assume that it will probably not completely go away that people actually have to write some custom black box functions that need to be wrapped in a way that that um, Dask Orgwork can use them. So um, um, when, when I first saw this, my, my first impulse was essentially that um, I would have written a decorator for this, essentially like a decorator that can decorate a function where I tell it um, which columns it touches and what is the return type. And then it automatically would sort of wrap the function such that I can directly use it in, uh, in Dask. Is this uh, uh, something that's planned for Dask awkward to have something like that or some little bit higher level way to to implement this if i remember correctly this was just mentioned in the awkward in the dask awkward meeting on friday right no, no. yeah yeah <laughs> uh the the idea of, so the um the, the general way of using it is as you as you've shown here you you write uh awkward functions and then you know dask turns every one of them into uh a node in the task graph and then uh dask attempts to uh optimize that graph um, uh, yeah, in the meeting on last Friday, we were, we were talking about introducing, in addition to this, uh, sort of a, an escape valve, just like numbers in escape valve, <clears throat> a, um, a way of wrapping a function and everything inside of that function is going to be just strictly mapped, you know, um, everything in there, um, uh, uh, when da the, the the whole the whole function becomes one node in the Dask graph, and everything is is um, on the worker implemented in some eager way. Uh, it would be a way of um, a user specifying that a particular section of code is definitely um, some simple MapReduce, uh, and don't consider the general graph case uh, and the the time it takes for the, the graph optimization to uh, to figure that out can sometimes be prohibitive and sometimes the graph optimization doesn't figure it out if it's written in a particular way. So, so this would be a way for the user to add that information, to be able to tell it, no, this section of code is uh, uh, it's just MapReduce. Um, but because of that, I would call that more low level than what, what's going on here is because um, uh, you, you know you have the user going out of their way in order to uh, 
tell DAS that a particular section should be uh, paralyzed in a particular way. But that's that's something we're just talking about at this stage. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's the simplest, it's the most simple thing to get it right, right? Yeah. I mean that the um the cast test topology, what do you want to call it? The 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 graph the the graphness of that is, is no. simple. Ah, right. yeah, yeah, but I mean, you have like you have different operations on the type tracer. You have different like then length zero, length one, or just touch data. Maybe you don't want even the return. Um, yeah, yeah. The purpose of this would be, you know, you've got you're doing something particularly complicated, and you know that it slows down the the graph optimizer, or the graph optimizer doesn't realize that it's 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 just MapReduce, uh, and you want to tell it that. Mm-hmm. 